Hello, everybody. I hope you can hear me. Um, my name is Chris Bauer. I'm a transportation planner at the Capital District Transportation Committee. Um, with me today, I have Stephen Maples, a new transportation planner here at CDTC with uh, emphasis on public participation. Um, I am uh, filling in for Jen Saponis today on our uh, New Visions um, webinar series for February. Today's topic is air quality and transportation planning. And uh, we'll go ahead and get started here. Just so everyone knows the meeting is being recorded. Um, and just a couple of notes about our webinars. Um, your uh, mic is muted. Um, for the attendees, you can see us, but we cannot see you. Um, to open the chat, you can click on the chat icon and send messages to the host me or the panelists or any of the attendees. If you have a question, please type that into the chat box or you can uh, raise your hand and we will unmute you. Um, or you can type a question into the Q&A box, so whatever you prefer. Our uh, New Visions webinar series is eligible for one uh, AICP certification maintenance credit. Um, to do that, you'll need to log on to your um, your APA uh, uh, AICP log. Um, these webinars also meet the requirements for the required uh, planning and zoning and county planning board um, hours of training. And um, that can be done um, through a approval through your local government. For more information, you can contact the uh, Department of State about that particular item. All right, let's see here. And trying to get back to my okay sorry about that okay um, so this we do have um, we do have a webinar each month uh, next month um, on March 22nd, um, we'll be focusing on uh, climate change and how to plan for a resilient transportation system. And the following month in April, we'll be talking about um, what our regional planning agency can do for us. For more information on how to register for those, please see our website, cdtcmpo.org slash news slash new vision webinars. Um, also, we have a new visions page that has um, all of the webinars recorded on there, as well as other resources for implementing new visions. So for today's agenda, um, I'm gonna give a brief overview of the new visions plan um, and its, its primary components. I'm going to talk for a moment about some strategies that we have here at CDTC for managing air quality in our region. And then I'm gonna turn it over to a presentation from DEC and then I'll wrap it up talking about some of the um, things that we do to meet air quality conformity here um, at the MPO. And we'll hold our questions and discussion until the end. So just a little bit about CDTC. We are the designated uh, metropolitan planning organization for the four county um, capital New York region, um, including uh, Albany County, Schenectady County, Rensselaer County, and Saratoga County with the exception of the town of Moreau and the village of South Glens Falls. Our members include um, cities, towns, villages, counties, and then some of the other folks you see here, the airport, the port, Thruway Authority, CDTA, DOT, and uh, CDRPC. Our primary, um, our, our, our primary function is, is for uh, transportation policy making and planning, and uh, we allocate federal transportation funding resources. Uh, three or, or essentially the three key functions of our MPO, um, three products that we're required to do is our long range transportation plan, which is New Visions 2050. This is the overarching long range document that guides our principles and our decision making. Um, on the next order down is our transportation improvement program, our TIP. That's our five year uh, capital program of transportation projects. And then to support both of those is our Unified Planning Work Program, which is our uh, budget document that contains all of our staff activities and uh, budgets. 
So what is New Visions 2050? New Visions 2050 is a blueprint for regional transportation that reflects a shared vision, um, a shared regional vision for the future. It's a 30 year plan. So it's a long range plan to guide prior priorities and funding. And it's developed collaboratively with us here, transportation providers, um, local government, state agencies, the private sector, and of course the public. So what is in the New Visions 2050 plan? Um, the, the centerpiece of, of the plan is our, uh, our 15 planning and investment principles. Um, these are directly related to the criteria that we use to evaluate proposed projects and prioritize, prioritize them for federal funding. Um, these 15 planning and investment principles were developed and proposed um, over a long range of time and they're refined each time that we updated our long range transportation plan by several task force and advisory committees that we use to develop our new visions plan. Um, and they influence the type of tasks and initiatives that we are that we use in order to implement the plan. Um, some of the best practices and, and policies that are proposed in New Visions 2050 are, um, of course, maintaining a state of good repair on our transportation system, um, congestion management, complete streets, transit-oriented development and smart growth, access management, uh, safety, including um, Vision Zero, um, American with Disability Act, ADA compliance, and um, expanding our public participation role. Um, just a snapshot of our regional transportation system. We have 14,000 lane miles of roadway, uh, 1,200 sidewalk miles, over 1,000 bridges, um, more than 130 miles of trails and 33 miles of bike facilities. We have major regional um, facilities such as the Port of Albany, um, the train station at Rensselaer, uh, the airport, and of course several um, intermodal uh, facilities and, and CDTA's fixed route bus system. Some uh, overarching trends that um, I just wanted to shed some light on is that the CDTC region is not growing. However, that does not mean that we are not um, experiencing uh, growth and development. Um, so we do see, you know, construction out there, even though our population uh, numbers have remained relatively steady and are expected to do so over the next 30 years. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, um, we, we have, um, you know, seen an increase in, in driving recently um, and, of course, changing needs of our of, of what's going on with our um, transportation system and all the things that have happened with the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we have a very um, valuable but aging road and bridge network with a um, estimated replacement value of over $30 billion. And, um, you know, that's very important because nearly all of our modes rely on um, roads and bridges. So uh, now just digging a little bit more into um, air quality. Um, this graphic here shows the primary sources of, of transportation related air pollution. And generally those are, are broken into two categories, um, on-road and off-road or non-road. Um, and you can see here that on-road is what you'd expect light and heavy duty vehicles and motorcycles. And off-road includes things like um, lawnmowers, uh, marine vessels, aircraft, trains, uh, ATVs, and things of that sort. Um, there are obviously many solutions that um, can, can have an impact on transportation um, emissions and air pollution. Uh, some of those, uh, those that are more towards the left side of this graphic are, are controlled in the manufacturer level. Um, but what we feel like we can have some impact here at the MPO is more towards the right side, which is encouraging alternative vehicle technologies and better transportation planning to link, um, you know, to link transportation and land use and um, understand the importance of freight and also mitigate the negative impacts of um, emissions from, from transportation and on-road uses. And kind of drilling that, you know, in a little bit more. So, so, you know, what can we do? We can try to shift more trips to transit, walking, bicycling and other mobility sources. Um, we can try to, to do um, projects that reduce congestion and uh, reduce vehicle idling. Um, we can work at ways to optimize freight mobility and deliveries and try to you know handle some of the uh, 
excuse me, some of the situations that we are seeing now with increased, um, you know, freight deliveries at the local level. Um, we can provide better transit and other mobility services. Uh, travel demand management, TDM, is a big part of what we do here and, and, and touches on all of the subjects above it. And um, to the extent possible, try to implement new technologies, um, you know, smart cities technologies that can make our system more efficient. Um, as far as alternative vehicle technologies, um, and this is something that we do through our clean communities program, which I will discuss a little bit later. Um, some of the things that we've been doing is working with fleets to right size and shift to cleaner fuels and technologies, particularly large fleets. Um, we have um, programs to encourage employers to provide EV charging. Um, there is initiatives to electrify transit and school buses, which is, a, is, is you know, there's a lot of potential there. And um, something that we expect to see more of with the new infrastructure bills, expanding EV infrastructure, um, including, you know, making the changes to zoning that we need for those to happen seamlessly and other regulations um, that, you know, could be maybe at odds with EV infrastructure. And then as far as, you know, how do we move from, you know, this planning and implementation, we do that through our transportation improvement program, our TIP. Um, which, as I mentioned earlier, you know, has evaluation criteria that um, align with our planning and investment principles, including environment. Um, we can um, make sure that we're utilizing to the extent possible um, funding sources that support air quality improvement projects such as CMAC. And we also, um, we have an air quality conformity process, which I'll talk about a little bit later. A lot of this, you know, requires us to work closely with our state partners, including the DOT, the DEC, NYSERDA, and the Department of Health. And just really quickly wanted to um, highlight some of the accomplishments of our, of our previous long range plan, which was establishment of the uh, bus, rapid transit, B, bus rapid transit BRT system, um, development of the regional trail network, um, in uh, uh, introduction of, of several uh, safety projects, including roundabouts and supportive um, infrastructure for electric and alternative vehicles. Um, all this has, has, you know, sort of been turned upside down with COVID. And this is, this is just a graphic here showing um, the changes in traffic volumes that we saw after New York pa on pause took effect on uh, March uh, 22nd of 2020. And this is about uh, uh, roughly, you know, the year of 2020 data after that. And we can see that, I think, as we all know and, and are very understand very well now that COVID had a major disruptive effect on our transportation system and likewise an effect on air quality and perhaps, you know, will change the way we think about how we handle some of these situations in the future. And of course, you know, this isn't in our region, but just underscores the importance of air quality and uh, you know what it had, the impact it has on our environment and our quality of life, and um, and and you know the importance of 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 the um, standards that we have here in the U.S. and in our region, and um, we know what that affords for us. So with that, um, just a quick look at our agenda for today. Um, I think we already kind of went through this, so I am going to now turn the presentation over to. Mike uh, Sheehan, I just want to introduce him real quick. Mike Sheehan is the director of the Division of Air Resources Bureau of Air Quality Planning at the New York State Department of Environmental Conf Conservation, the DEC. Uh, in this capacity, he is responsible for overseeing the Bureau's activities, which include the development of the state implementation plans, mobile and stationary source emission inventories, and air pollution control regulations. Uh, we greatly appreciate uh, Mike's time today. So Mike, I will turn it over to you. Gotta find all the buttons. Thanks, Chris. Good, thanks, Chris. Um, my guy here is really just to come out to the general background. Hi, Mike. Yeah, I can see your slides. The audio is a little bit, um, it's coming through a little bit garbled. I don't know if that's my um, 
computer. So I'm going to go ahead and turn off my video just in case it's a bandwidth issue. How's that? That sounds good. Go ahead. Okay. So I just want to, uh, the focus of my presentation is, is tilted towards medium and heavy duty vehicles primarily because that's where it's negative. Uh, Tickety's on, so I'm going to deny some general background. Doctors in fear from the decision to be a congregation. Um, I got an overview of those ethics. Briefly, I think that is something that's been going to be carried out with something like that. Hey, Mike, sorry to interrupt. I'm, we're having some issues. At least I am here. I don't know if any of the other attendees are, but I, I'm having some trouble hearing you. It sounds yeah, like I'm maybe the. Yeah, it sounds like maybe the uh, microphone or something. It sounds like uh, sort of like you're um, in a metal tunnel or something like that. Uh, you stop my video, see if, it's, if that's contributing. Any better? That sounds a little better. Sure, go ahead. All right, I'll, I'll slow it down too. Um, the problem is I'm not seeing the slides advance. Okay, yeah, you're on the slide that says agenda. Yeah. No, oh, all right. If there's a lag, apologies. Okay. Um, so this is a general um, background on greenhouse gas emissions um, from the 2018 uh, U.S. inventory. It basically shows that um, transportation contributes nearly 30% of U.S. GHG emissions, but how um, the portion um, that's contributed by medium and heavy duty trucks and buses is nearly 30%. And while light duty vehicles um, dominate based on vehicle miles traveled from that category, um, because of the changes in the economy and the movement of goods, medium and heavy duty trucks and buses are growing rapidly. Similarly, um, that sector contributes um, significantly to um, smog forming um, pollutants, um, nitrogen oxides, and volatile organic compounds, um, and is a primary driver of, of health concerns um, based on the emissions of fine particulate matter. One of the primary drivers um, that we are now noting, and, and um, the next slide will touch on, as required under the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, um, is the contribution of, of medium and heavy duty vehicles uh, and their impacts on frontline and environmental justice communities. Most of these communities are located on or near trucking routes, near ports, warehouses. Um, they are directly and disproportionately impacted. And, and research has showed um, that there's a direct correlation between exposures to nuclear pollution and increased health risks. Um, so while we continue to address criteria pollutants under the Clean Air Act, the primary driver and, and the, the thing that is driving most of the activities in our Bureau of Mobile Sources and Technology Development is the New York's adoption of the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act. This basically requires us to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 40% by 2030, by 85% by 2050. Um, it requires our electric generating sector to be 70% renewables by 2030, uh, and 100% zero carbon, carbon um, electricity by 2040. The unique part about New York's Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act uh, is it targets upstream em emissions from uh, electric generating and fuel, con fuel consumption uh, and apply the 20 year global warming potential, um, which increases the impact from other client pollutants um, that have a shorter um, residency time. The draft scoping plan is currently out for public comment uh, with the goal of, of a adopting that plan by 2022, it can basically highlight how the state will um, meet those goals. 
In addition to the Climate Leadership and Community Protection Act, the governor signed in September of 2021 uh, requirements that 100% of uh, zero emission vehicle, uh, passenger vehicle sales um, be zero emission vehicles by 2035. The trucks and buses hit that target by 2045. And that off road equipment by 2035 is 100% zero emission vehicle as well. The department to um, facilitate some of these activities um, is limited under the Clean Air Act to adopt standards that are either adopted by the federal government um, or California Air Resources Board. So we recently adopted at the end of 2021 the Advanced Clean Trucks um, initiative for the medium and heavy duty vehicles. The phase in reserves sales requirements that I just mentioned. Um, <clears throat> and the slide, and I, I can share this with the group, um, those regulations were promulgated under Part 218 and are available on our, on our website. The department is currently tracking and working with all of the states in the Northeast as well as California Air Resources Board um, on heavy duty locks, heavy duty low knocks omnibus. Advanced Clean Cars 2 uh, and Advanced Clean Fleets. Um, and our goal is to move forward with these um, proposals as soon as California adopts them. Under New York State's um, medium and heavy duty ZEB programs, there's also incentives. Um, a number of those come through some of our other sister agencies. Um, but DEC has sponsored a number of those under the VW settlement that was reached on a national basis. New York received $127 million under that program. And New York also provides a New York truck voucher incentive program uh, to incentivize cleaning up uh, trucks, transit buses, speed buses, uh, cargo handling equipment at our ports. New York City has a clean trucks program. The Public Service Commission um, has contributed funds. And lastly, um, the New York State Energy Resources Development Authority um, has provided $85 million to advance transportation electrification um, in other communities. Under the VW um, settlement, the state was to develop a plan to reduce diesel emissions by replacing and re repowering older diesel vehicles. Uh, we needed to factor in the statewide air quality improvement goals, prioritize those areas, and obviously do an inclusion in an eye towards addressing emissions in environmental justice neighborhoods. The goal would be to accelerate the transition to a zero emissions transportation system. Um, by incentivizing or, or creating incentives to use um, all electric vehicles. This chart just kind of outlines where some of those funds have, have been allocated to. Not all funds have been utilized to date, um, but it, it highlights where the $127 million uh, has been allocated as of October of you know, last year. Uh, this is just another look at the chart, more refined to highlight the class of the vehicles funded under that program. Uh, this slide just really provides additional information and links um, for people to, that are interested in more detailed information. Um, the medium and heavy duty ZEP page is updated on a regular basis as is um, the project funding and reporting under the VW settlement. In addition, it highlights some of the recent press announcements driving um, the transitions we are making um, from a regulatory standpoint. I mentioned that I would touch briefly on our monitoring network. This map highlights the 34 monitoring stations uh, in upstate New York that is run by our Bureau of Air Quality Surveillance um, and Monitoring section, not Bureau, excuse me, 
There's the additional 24 gallery locations in New York City and Long Island areas. So that's a total of 57 monitoring stations. Um, they vary on the species that they um, look for uh, based on population exposures, the sources in the area, transport of pollutants in that um, the New York City metropolitan area is strongly influenced by transported pollutants from large upland sources. It specifies the, the monitoring system, um, the frequency at, at which pollutants are monitored, the location um, is all determined by um, federal guidelines. Uh, we have locations in urban, rural, near road, near sources, and actually did a uh, localized community monitoring in South Albany um, a couple of years ago prior to the pandemic, uh, and learned a lot of valuable information as part of that effort. This mentions the other monitoring programs outside of the main system. We have um, the New road monitoring for NO2 at a couple of sites in the state. Air toxics um, is statewide. Uh, looks for VOCs, formaldehyde, uh, precursor assessment system, or PAM system. Uh, always evaluating what to find black carbon uh, at on your uh, road site. Uh, our mercury de deposition monitoring. Or acid rain testing system. That's really a general overview, um, but I'm open to any questions because my specialty is actually air quality planning, uh, SIP and conformity, uh, and I can I can get additional information if specifics are needed from our our mobile technology development group. That's it, Chris. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, that was very great overview. And just a reminder, if anybody has any questions for Mike, please type those into the chat box and we will take those at the end of the, um, at the end of the program here. So I'm gonna go ahead and move along and uh, share my screen here. Okay, hopefully you all can see my screen um, that says air quality conforming regulations and requirements. I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we are required to do with respect to air quality here at CETC and then touch a little bit on what we are not required to do, but what we can do or what, what we, you know, what we try to do. So, um, you know, our, first of all, just to kind of clear the air so that everyone knows, no pun intended, our current air quality designation is non-attainment for the 1997 National Ambient Air Quality Standard and an attainment for all other national ambient air quality standards. Um, sometimes this is referred to as an orphan area, which is a term that was coined in the legal arena after the uh, 2018 South Coast Air Quality Management District versus EPA case. Um, so in spite of the 2008 air quality standard being more stringent than the 1997, we, we are still required to, de to demonstrate that we are in attainment of the 1997 standard. Um, so as far as, you know, there are two different types of actions and triggers that we, that we do here administratively here at CDTC um, that deal with air quality conformity. The first is um, ICG consultation, uh, interagency consultation group. I'll talk about that in a moment. We do that for TIP amendments for all new projects or any substantial changes in project scope. And then sometimes the higher level of, of um, effort that we have to take is to develop a new conformity determination document. And we do that um, when there's a new TIP. So the last time we did that was for the 2019-24 TIP, but we are preparing to do that for the upcoming 22-2027 TIP. We also um, update our conformity determination for a new long range plan, which we did when we adopted New Visions 2050, or any time that there's a new non-exempt project um, in our region. And I'll, and I'll describe what that means in more detail later. Um, for more information on this, you can see 40 CFR part 
93.104. And there's another one too, I think it's part 105. I'm not sure, but um, that's where all these regulations live. So I'd mentioned the ICG. What is the ICG? It's the Interagency Consultation Group. It is a group of um, air quality professionals that uh, meet to discuss the MPO's projects. It consists of, um, of staff members from EPA, FHWA, FTA, New York State D DEC, and New York State DOT. And we coordinate all of our ICG consultation through New York State DOT's Environmental Sciences Bureau. As I mentioned, um, we, we consult with the ICG for TIP amendments. We do that by reviewing every TIP amendment that comes through our office, and then we coordinate with the ICG if it's needed. Um, the consultation, what does that ex consist of? It consists of defining whether the, the project is exempt from air quality um, conformity requirements or non-exempt from air quality conformity requirements. And we do that with exempt codes, which are proposed by CDTC staff. I won't go through all those. There's an example there on the right. Those codes, if you are interested, are available in our TIP document in Appendix K. Mostly everything we do here at CDTC, but not everything, is exempt. Um, for example, um, repaving a road or reconstructing a road as it is now without adding any lanes is exempt. Replacing bridges, um, most transit projects, most safety projects are are non-exempt. Are exempt. I'm sorry. Um, non-exempt, as I mentioned, requires updating um, our conformity determination document. And an example of something that might be non-exempt would be like a completely new roadway. Um, adding lanes, you know, if we added a lane to the Northway, that would be a non-exempt project. Um, a major transit expansion, like a new regional rail line or something like that would be non-exempt. So as I mentioned, our conformity termination, we update that with a new TIP, new LRTP or a new non-exempt project. That process takes a little bit longer um, and needs to be built into the project sponsor's timeline for non-exempt projects because we have to update the conformity determination narrative, which is the document shown on the right. It requires coordination with um, our MPO neighbor to the north, the Adirondack Glens Falls Transportation Council and New York State DOT regions one, two, and nine, all which have portions of their region in our air quality um, district. Um, also, this doesn't just require consultation, with the ICG, it requires public review and formal adoption and FHWA and FTA approval. So overall, it is a more onerous process, albeit a more um, you know, paper-based process because as I mentioned earlier, we are in attainment um, of the 2008 standard. But that's not to say that we don't, um, you know, we don't do anything for air quality. Uh, we are actually um, currently investigating um, the feasibility of doing some more project-based air quality modeling, even though we're not required to do that. Um, but sometimes, you know, we can even work sort of within what we have and try to uh, address um, air quality situations. And so I just was going to bring up a quick case study, which I think was mentioned briefly by Mike, um, about a uh, uh, a uh, project that we worked on that was, you know, kind of the intersection of transportation planning, EJ issues, and air quality issues. And that was our South Pearl Street heavy vehicle travel pattern study. And for those of you who are not familiar with that particular area, um, it is in the south end neighborhood of Albany. There is a public housing um, uh, site along South Pearl Street. Um, and there were concerns from the uh, residents of that um, um, sites as Reprentis Homes about air quality impacts from the railroad, port, and trucking activities, and just, just in general about the number of heavy vehicles traveling um, along South Pearl Street. So the study was looking at, um, the study was looking at, you know, uh, uh, several different things. And, and, you know, we, we did it sort of concurrently, or at least at the beginning of when DEC was starting their air quality uh, project, the Albany South End Community Air Quality Study. 
Um, and so we were able to collaborate a little bit with them and work together and, uh, and on this particular issue. But I, I can't talk too much about the DEC part of it, but I am going to just briefly go over the CTC part of the study. So, you know, we were looking at what are the heavy vehicle patterns along South Pearl Street and what we, can we do to mitigate those negative impacts, such as air quality impacts on the residents. This was the study area. Um, actually, let me advance this one here. This It's on South Pearl Street um, between um, Corning Hill Road and First Avenue in the south end of Albany. The yellow area that's highlighted towards the middle here, it says Ezra Prentice, is the, the housing property. And we also looked at the corridor there. But I think what you can really see from this image is that it's surrounded by a lot of commercial industrial land uses. Um, including the Port of Albany, the Kenwood Rail Yard, and um, I-787. Um, uh, it's clearly within an EJ area in terms of both um, percent below poverty and percent minority, um, which you can see sort of envelops our study area, which is that gray uh, blob and the line in the middle there. So um, we collected, um, you know, kind of at the same time that, that uh, DEC was doing their air quality sampling, we collected um, information about heavy vehicles, where they're going, where they're coming uh, from using uh, license plate readers. Um, and DOT was out there doing uh, traffic volume, traffic speed, and uh, vehicle class counts. And as I mentioned, DEC doing their air quality sampling. So it was a, a, a multi-agency effort. Um, for us, you know, we, we essentially capture license plate images and use those to, to come up with where trucks are coming from and going to and see what impact we could have um, with some solutions in the neighborhood. And then we use that data to come up with routes from each origin along the corridor. I don't need to get into all the details here, but it was essentially trying to understand what can we do, what is feasible in that area, um, you know, to reduce the number of vehicles that would improve the air quality for the residents there. Um, as I mentioned, DOT did a volume, speed, and class count at the same time. This was back in 2017. And there were about um, 1,600 uh, trucks, heavy vehicles per day on that, on that road, um, which we use as the basis for our analysis. About 14% trucks, which if you're not in the know, that's pretty heavy. That's a, that's, a, that's a pretty high percent heavy vehicles. And actually we had some residents that were telling us like, oh, there's a thousand trucks per day or so. We actually had more than that. So they, it, it sort of, um, it, it reinforced what the residents were telling us. Um, like I said, DEC had a much larger study going on, a much more comprehensive effort that lasted for over a year. And um, I'm not certainly the expert to talk about that, but um, I, uh, I encourage you to check out the website here um, and see the quite impressive um, amount of data and analysis they did for that project. And so in our study, again, like even though it wasn't directly, you know, we couldn't model air quality, we could, we could do um, things that we thought would improve the air quality and quality of life for the residents. And this is just a couple of the things we came up with, which was encouraging some of the heavy vehicles to use alternative routes, which is an initiative that the city took on. Um, developing an alternative route, which we're calling the port route through um, the Port of Albany, and uh, several other education enforcement encouragement three E's programs that you know would would um, you know clearly uh, or or at least try to better um, you know identify that this is you know a residential area um, in the midst of, of of all these industrial land uses. So that is my presentation about the. Um, air quality conformity at CDTC. I'm just going to briefly here run through a couple of wrap up slides and then we will open it up to questions. Um, so uh, just real quickly about the new visions implementation. As I mentioned, you know, our major CDTC, CDTC products are all um, focused on implementing new visions. We also have this virtual learning series, which we do monthly. But what I really wanted to point out is that we, you can request virtual training for your planning board, zoning board, town board, city council, uh, uh, by going to our website and filing a request there or by contacting Jen Saponis and her email is here at the bottom. Um, I also wanted to let you know that we do have a public comment period open right now for our draft 22 23 un, uh, unified planning work program 
It's a mouthful. Um, and you can, uh, you can see the uh, draft plan and the related materials on our website at cdtcmpo.org uh, backslash 2022 UPWP. Um, any comments you have, you can submit to us um, in several different ways. You can submit it through social media. You can submit, submit it um, to our email, cdtc at cdtcmpo.org or do snail mail or leave voicemail. And of course, all this is available in uh, multiple languages. We do have several programs for planning assistance available to local governments, including our transportation community linkage program, our linkage studies, which is probably our, our marquee um, program here. We also have our uh, CDTC, CDRPC technical assistance program, where we do many, many different types of projects, um, including data collection, data analysis, uh, general planning, trails planning, safety planning, uh, small scale modeling analyses. There's a lot we can do with that. I wanted to just make a quick plug here for the Capital District uh, Clean Communities Program. You can join that coalition by contacting Jacob Beeman at jbeeman at cdtcmpo.org. Um, there is, uh, they have quite a program. You can request technical assistance uh, for fleet inventories or electric vehicle planning. Um, we have a capital um, district zero emission vehicle plan um, that you can view on our website and there are regular meetings for that. But that's a great way to get involved in this particular arena um, and um, you know, helps us uh, meet the goals of new visions and electrification um, and of course, cleaner air. Okay, uh, data, we collect a lot of data which we make available for free to our members including the GIS um, files of sidewalks, bike inventory, trails. We have bike and trail counts. We have bike and trail counters. Um, we have survey templates and uh, data. We have safety data. So there's a lot of stuff that we can provide um, and reach out to us if you're interested in any of those. Now, without further ado, um, I wanted to open it up to any questions. And just a reminder, if you have a question, uh, you can put that into the chat pod or you can um, raise your hand. And um, I'm just going to give it one second here just to see if anybody has anything before we close out. Give it the going once, going twice. All right. Well, hearing none, um, we will go ahead. Um, and close out today's uh, New Visions webinar. Um, you can view all of our previous New Visions webinars at ctcmpo.org slash news slash NV webinars. Uh, we also check out our Learning Center, which you can find on our website and any other assistance you can find on um, our website or by uh, reaching out to us directly. And um, any, uh, any emails directly related to New Visions, you can send to New Visions at CTCMPO. We have our host of social media channels over here on the right. And so I just wanted to thank everyone for your time today. I wanted to particularly thank uh, Mike Sheehan for his, from DEC for his time and his excellent presentation. Um, a copy of this um, webinar will be posted to our website. And I hope everyone has a great afternoon. Thanks again. Thanks, Bill.